fellow footy travelers. Welcome to the Footy Travelers Podcast, where soccer or football crazed travelers tell their best stories and share their expert advice. My name's Colin Martin, one of your co-hosts. My buddy Mike Taroni and I have been traveling the world for the beautiful game for well over a decade now. We've been to a handful of World Cups, plenty of league games, and all six inhabitable continents together, playing tourist and catching the footy in each and every one of them. And whether you've been listening to FTP since the beginning, or you've just discovered us recently, it's great to have you here. If you love the beautiful game, both on and off the pitch, and you like travel to boot, you are in the right place. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Footy Travelers Podcast. If you listen to our previous episode, you know we've hit pause on creating new episodes of the Footy Travelers podcast for the winter, ostensibly to enjoy some time with our families and friends. But we don't want you, our loyal listener, to go without great footy travel content, so we're bringing you episodes of other footy, travel, or footy travel podcasts we think you'll enjoy. Today's presentation is episode two of Counterspective the first season of which was the precursor to the Footy Travelers podcast. And to be fair, the entire Footy Travelers project in general, I suppose. This episode explores the topics at the heart of Mike's and my trip to Russia for World Cup 2018. The soccer itself, FIFA, of course, and even some exploration of Russian hooliganism. Before we dive in, though, a few reminders. If you want to hear the bonus episodes from Counterspective Season 1, including an exploration of the Kremlin and a fun travel story from some Swedes who sailed their way to World Cup 2018, like on a small sailboat, just search for the Counterspective feed in your podcast app. We'll also leave some links in the show notes. And if you like what you hear, whether in this episode or any of our over 50 episodes so far, please, please, please leave us a rating wherever you're listening and a proper review if you're listening on Apple Podcasts. You can also support us by supporting our sponsors, Race to Adventure. Check out the show notes for more on them and the great things they have to offer. Finally, don't forget that the Footy Travelers fan shop is now open. Perhaps you'd like to show your support for the Footy Traveler lifestyle with one of our custom designed jerseys or a classic supporter scarf. Both are available right now. You can head to footytravelers.com for a click-through link, head directly to footytravelers.square.site, or just click the link in the show notes. Hurry though, quantities are limited and supplies won't last during this busy holiday season. All right, without further ado, here's Counterspective Season 1, Episode 2, FIFA, Footy, and Russian Hooligans. Okay. Uh, uh, the teams are owned by uh, different people, right. not, not by governmental companies. Right, private people. Private, yeah, Pri- yeah private people. Yeah. Uh, uh, here, let's, all right, Gazprom. We want a new football players for Zenit. So, hello, Ukraine. Your guess is <laughs> yeah. the price for your guess is growing up. Going up. <laughs> ah. As Mike and I were preparing for our third consecutive World Cup last year, this time in the Russian Federation, the oversimplified stereotype of Russians as a bunch of hackers sitting in a dark, damp basement waiting for unsuspecting Westerners to tap into their Wi-Fi networks laid heavy in the back of my mind. My worst nightmare yep. is this all part of this huge grand scheme to get the world into their country, connected to their networks, And then they're like, just going to upload a bunch of fucking malware to everyone's devices and they take it back to their home countries and now they're in. But it wasn't just my nervousness around personal cybersecurity that stoked a hesitation to make the trip. There's another federation who was even more responsible than Russia for the tournament's organization. There's a few stereotypes about them too. FIFA, the Federation Internationale de Football Association. 
The most dominant stereotype about FIFA is that it operates almost entirely under a corrupt code of bribery, money laundering, and match fixing, as opposed to a code of, you know, ethics. Suffice it to say, it's another stereotype that isn't necessarily untrue. You've probably heard of the corruption case that U.S. prosecutors brought against FIFA in 2015. There were more than a handful of official allegations, not the least of which were the ones of bribery during the selection process for the host of the 2010 World Cup in South Africa and the upcoming 2022 World Cup in Qatar. All of this is to say that especially after the U.S. men had failed to qualify for 2018, I was primed to internalize the single story of FIFA, the story of corruption, and I found myself fairly hesitant to support an organization embroiled in scandal. But can you really enjoy top-tier or international soccer anymore without the suspicion of corruption or scandal? Would my individual boycott of the game I've come to love really be worth anything in the grand scheme of things? Maybe. I guess the better question is, am I willing to forego such an epic experience to make a statement that would almost definitely fall on deaf ears? From my perspective, when it comes to top-level football, whether it's clubs like Manchester City that are privately held, or ones like Zenit St. Petersburg from the opening of this episode that are owned by government-held gas companies like Gazprom. It's hard to argue with the idea that sometimes money buys success, however you earn or collect it. Uh, uh, here, let's, all right, Gazprom. We want a new football players for Zenit. So, hello, Ukraine. Your guess is... <laughs> the price for your guess is growing up. Going up. <laughs> this is Alex. No, I'm joking, of course. <laughs> of course they've got enough money to pay for yeah, yeah. They don't need to increase the prices for Ukraine, but, uh, <laughs> you know, that's funny. Alex is one of the founders of Bakunin Brewery, based in St. Petersburg, and runs an awesome bar, Rockets and Bishops, both of which we'll revisit in a future episode. Mike and I spent a good amount of time at Rockets and Bishops, learning about the Russian craft beer scene, but also all sorts of things about modern Russian culture from Alex's perspective. Nice, Alex. Mike. Colin. Colin? Colin, yeah. Right. Nice to meet nice you. Nice to meet you. Uh, well, so you use my bar. Eventually, I looked past not only the potential realities embedded within Alex's joke about Gazprom and Senate St. Petersburg, but my prejudices towards FIFA, and I decided to follow through with our plans. Well, who am I kidding? These World Cup trips have become a bit of a pilgrimage with one of my best friends. FIFA or not, I was always going to make the trip. So instead of boycotting, I went into the experience curious to find out what Russian citizens thought of their country playing host, and what sports looked like for them beyond soccer. And if I'm being completely honest, I kind of wanted to find out how true some of the stereotypes about Russian athletes are. Open-ended, what comes to mind? Drugs. <laughs> if someone says Russian sports, the first thing I think about is Ivan Drago. But I also know they like to take some of the steroids. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, that is the first thing that comes to mind when you talk about Russian sports is uh, bodily enhancing materials. I'll tell you up front, juiced Russian athletes didn't really come up during our time in Moscow and St. Petersburg. In this episode, we take a look at some other stories Mike and I heard about Russia and its sporting ways. These are the stories that gave us a new and distinctive perspective of Russia. This is Counterspective. I don't think anyone would put up an argument, Russians included, if I said that Russia's reputation in the sporting world isn't based on its football, excuse me, its soccer prowess. At least, that was my perception before our trip there. And it was a perception I heard from others, too. When I ask folks, like my coworker and friend, Stephanie, what comes to mind when I mention Russian sports, soccer was never the answer. Cold, perhaps? Snow sports, I would imagine they're great at. I actually don't have any insight into that at all. My partner Kelsey's response was pretty similar. Open-ended, what comes to mind? Drugs. Okay. 
<laughs> what did you say? Doping? <laughs> no, I said hockey. Hockey. With the frozen tundra of Siberia in their backyard, and over 100 Winter Olympic medals to their name since 1994, not to mention nostalgia-inducing films like Miracle, Five seconds left in the game. Do you believe in miracles? Yes! it's no surprise that we think of Russians as champions of the cold weather sports. The internet doesn't help either. One afternoon of browsing left me under the impression that bandy was their national sport. I learned that the national sport of Russia is bandy. Bandy. It's like ice hockey, but like soccer, like or football. Yeah, yeah football. And that everyone loved it. Not so much the case, at least for folks I asked in Moscow. No, they don't play it in Russia. No. If you've never heard of bandy, or as the Russians apparently call it, Russian hockey, you should check it out. We'll leave some info on the episode page at FiberMedia.com. If you're curious now, though, just imagine a game of traditional ice hockey. Substitute the puck with a ball. Uh, on ice with a ball and not a puck. And add in the way that soccer is played. 11 aside. Like 11, say soccer. 11 players. <laughs> over two 45-minute halves. There you go. Bandy. I found it a bit funny that what's in some places advertised as Russia's national sport, a sport they're one of, if not the best at, wasn't all that popular with the majority of folks I talked to about it. And I mean the best. Considering Russia and the former Soviet Union together, out of the 39 iterations of the Bandy World Championship played so far, Russia, or the Soviet Union, has made it to the final 37 times, winning the gold medal in 26 of those games. The two times they failed to reach the final, they won bronze. The only other country that's medaled every time since the first competition in 1957 is Sweden. As another nation stereotypically successful in winter sports, that's probably not surprising. Sweden and Russia's proximity to one another likely also contributes to both nations' success, as they competitively push each other toward it. You know what else that proximity helped? The Swedish turnout at the World Cup. Their presence was strong in St. Petersburg. Anyway, despite Russia's dominance in bandy, it's other sports that are more popular across the country. And, um, so what was your name? Ekaterina. Ekaterina. What's, so what's the number one NBA. sport in Russia? Yeah, yeah, you can uh, hockey, I think so. Hockey? hockey. Ice hockey? <laughs> now that we got the uh, yes. If we had only talked to Katerina, I might have maintained my perception that ice hockey was all that Russians enjoyed in the way of sports. But as we talked to others... I started to realize that football, soccer, was right up there next to hockey. Here's Alex again. Soccer is not the most popular sport in Russia. No, it's quite popular. It's quite popular. What's no, the number one? More than one? hockey? Huh? More than ice hockey? Oh, sure. Ice hockey is nice. Yeah. I prefer ice hockey. Yeah. But uh, football is very popular. Sure, it was easy to see the popularity during the World Cup, and perhaps it was exaggerated because of the tournament especially that evening after Russia beat former World Cup champion Spain. Penalties will decide. Akinfeyev saves! It is Russia's party, and the party goes on! Russia roars as one! But listening to Alex, you got the sense that soccer has only been gaining momentum lately, and that a younger generation of players, despite their inexperience, is inspiring hope in Russia's national team. Young Russian guys were playing uh, very powerful football. Yeah. They, they've got uh, bad techniques. They're really young, but there's a lot of effort. You know, teams like Russia that are inexperienced or maybe young or, very young. or not These are guys not skilled. Young. Yeah. Well, five years ago, Russian team consisted of 11 uh, tired millionaires. From Zenit, from Spartak, from Dynamo. Do you think that this result will encourage the country to support soccer and football in, in Russia more? Sure. Yeah. yeah. As Alex attested, Russia isn't great at soccer, but it's nonetheless very popular. More so than bandy, and apparently right up there with ice hockey. And really, depending on how you measure popularity, you could argue that soccer, as the most watched sport in Russia, is the most popular. And so, while we might see Russia as juggernauts of cold-weather sports like ice hockey, 
as fans and spectators, Russians share in this global appreciation for the beautiful game, which to me is what makes an event like the World Cup so unifying versus, say, the Olympics. Mike shared his thoughts on this on one of our first nights in Moscow. When you talk about comparing the World Cup to the Olympics, it's, there's no comparison because soccer is its own language. And the Olympics is, is a national, yeah, it's a nationalistic event based off of sports that people typically don't follow. With soccer more popular in Russia than I was expecting, I became increasingly curious to hear how the Russians felt about hosting the tournament in their country. Some folks, like Boris, another friendly guy from Rockets and Bishops in St. Petersburg, testified to the happiness that a collective population can feel as host to this great world party. Everybody, the, don't, no matter who you are, no matter what's your job, no matter how, many, how much money do you have, yeah. and all this, uh, just everybody is mm, insane happy. Yeah, about, actually, yeah, passionate about, about that, and uh, nothing, nothing else matters. Playing host to a World Cup is great, but it's even better when your team wins. As someone who's witnessed firsthand both the thrill of victory... It's on here now! The goalkeeper's beaten! And South Africa have their first goal! Sipiwi Shabalala! And the agony of defeat that a host nation can feel... This is quite astonishing! It's all over now! It really is all over for Brazil! I can say that even for visiting fans, the whole experience is much better for everyone when the host nation does well. People are, as Boris says, insane happy. And so for Russia, the deeper they went into the tournament, the happier people seem to be. But not everyone in Russia was thrilled about the World Cup taking place in their own backyard. Some people seemed conflicted at best. Here's Katerina again. Do you think um, all the Russian people, they like having the World Cup in their country, or...? For us, it's like a, some kind of you know, holiday, some uh, celebration or something like yeah. this. <laughs> but uh, if you're honest, I, be, I was not for World Cup in oh. Russia. Really? Yes. Why? Uh, because Moscow is, a, is a, a very crowded and yeah, foreign people so. it's more crowded right, exactly. so I don't like it yeah. and so, so but everything well, organizes very well so yeah. it's yeah. which made me wonder was there anyone in Russia as suspicious as I was about FIFA and its stranglehold on the world's most popular sport or did everyone see things completely different did people wonder as much as I did just how well organized the tournament was again it's tough to argue with the rankings Russia's not particularly a strong side these days. But home field advantage can be a strong factor. I don't know. Am I being overly cynical? For me, for example, uh, how Russian teams play now, it's, it, they're not a good team. They, yeah. they can't win. But uh, you see what happened. So are you, do, you, do you think someone paid money somewhere? Yeah? I think so. So many money, so yeah. many corruption. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we know, we know. <laughs> yes, we've heard, yeah. The stereotype about corruption in Russian athletics and their state-sponsored doping tactics is based in plenty of reality. At least enough reality that the Russian Olympic Committee was suspended from the 2018 Winter Games. And if you listen closely enough to that single story about Russian athletes, coaches, and officials, you can start to make out a residual stereotype that all Russians are complicit in the matter, that they're fully on board with the whatever-it-takes attitude and support their nation's use of less-than-honorable strategies. But if you talk with and listen to them, the average Russian citizen, that is, you're reminded of the danger of the single story. Oh, I think it's just prestige for the country, and plus it's another chance to steal so much money, you know, so <laughs> me, you know, but I'm quite pessimistic about all this. That's a friend we made during our trip. For the sake of not throwing her under the bus for calling out that possibility right there, we'll call her Mary. You'll hear from her later in the podcast as well, but I wanted to introduce her now because her comment is an appropriate warning against going too far with stereotypes. Not all Russians support institutional cheating. But, as Mike and I learned during our two weeks in Moscow and St. Petersburg, many Russians are passionate and proud of their athletes. Perhaps it was that passion and pride that drove the team deeper into the tournament than anyone had expected. 
They're competitive. They're contenders. Wouldn't it be the same for any host nation? But even if you take the doping away, they're contenders. Just as we do here, right? Like sports mean something to us. Like they're part of our American identity. Mm -hmm. It's the same for them. Mm -hmm. There's no difference. You remember Brad, my buddy who was a little worried that if I didn't play my cards right, I might not make it back. Just be careful, please. The people who love you like really love you. And if you're gone, it's a lot of pain. I'm not wholly concerned. I'm proud of you for going on this trip. I think it's a love of sport that drives you there. But do be cautious about you're not in where you think you are. It was, and it is, a love of sport, a very specific sport that drives me to travel and experience tournaments like the World Cup firsthand. It's that love of such an internationally unifying game that has exposed me to new cultures and how fans from different nations get up for their country. Except that before this last trip, even with two previous World Cups under our belts, I didn't feel like I had a good sense of what Russian fans would be like. In my conversation with Brad and Kelsey leading up to my departure, I wondered if they had any insights. Turns out, we were all equally curious. You know, it's interesting because I feel like I could answer that about certain cultures. I can't answer that about Russians because I've really never interacted with Russians before. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like they travel that much. We've never like run into them. And just while we're stereotyping, like they're easy to spot, track suits and (laughs) 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 I think each country has their idiosyncrasies when it comes to fanaticism and that only becomes more prevalent in size. Mm. And so while we can't sit here and think, okay, how are Russian fans? Because we've never seen them in multitudes. I think when you're there, you're going to see how Russian fans are. And I'm curious to know how that is. Mm-hmm. You will see. For sure. Yeah, because they'll be braced by their numbers, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Gets, yeah. yeah. While I certainly didn't have much exposure to the idiosyncrasies of Russian soccer fans at previous World Cups, And while Kelsey and Brad had just as much awareness as I did to offer, the truth is, I had heard one story about Russian soccer fans. In fact, it was one of those single stories about a group of people that might make you avoid them altogether, at all costs. But this wasn't a story about just any group of sports fans. I'm talking about Russian hooligans. What is the biggest thing that you're sort of worried about? Honestly... The hooliganism, they have a really strong and deeply rich culture of hooliganism in Russia. And a lot of it is around international teams that they rivals with. England versus Russia. England specifically. I was like, yeah, I'd really love to be able to like watch some English matches with some English fans. And I've heard it from my English friends where they're like, don't, don't go to the stadiums. Don't be near it because you're only asking to get in trouble with these hoogans. So now I'm like being a little bit more sensitive to the idea that like we would be a target. We could say we're, we're, fa- we're from England and we're fans of English. You sound like you're from London. <laughs> I mean, I'm happy to put on an English accent the whole time, but I'm pretty concerned about that because I don't want to make ourselves any bigger of a target than we could be. Do you think we'll be a target as Americans? Uh, no, because... We're going to be Canadian. (laughs) They are friendly, those Canadians. Speaking of stereotypes, football hooligans, though, far from friendly. He made me feel sick! I hit him with a brick! Now the cunts! Not laughing, I'm singing! For anyone who's ever seen the film Green Street Hooligans, first of all, good on you for getting through the whole thing. Second, you know how serious true hooliganism can be. You know, Mike and I weren't worried about your average, everyday sports fan who has one too many beers before he decides to mouth off and start a fight that he'll probably wind up apologizing for the next day. I'm talking about your diehard, dedicated gangbangers who show love for their team with their fists and who are apparently incredibly organized. Yeah, I heard uh, the Russian fans and the hooligans, they like, they, they schedule fights. Yeah. Like, oh, they meet each other and then just fight. Yeah. Yeah. This is Timothy. Timothy, in a small world story for the ages, actually spent a significant amount of time during summer months in my hometown in New Jersey. So real quick, right now I am in Moscow, Russia, talking to my bartender. And where did you spend time in the United States? Sicklerville. Sicklerville. What state is that? Where is Sicklerville? 
This is amazing. This is amazing. Um, I grew up in Sickleville, New Jersey. Right. And yes, Timothy was also a bartender that we befriended. Now I'm I'm sensing a sub theme here too, but hey, I did say that this season would be a bit of a travel blog from a World Cup tourist perspective. I guess the stereotypes about us and our drinking habits aren't entirely untrue either. So we're not it's the just, only ones. Yeah, it's just that you come, you spend a whole day drinking, and the next day you're out. Disregard and then the next day you have to you start again. You spend, yeah. And then it's you just start a very much a, it's an up very much a roller coaster. That's Louise. She, whoa, hold on, hold on. I'm getting totally sidetracked here. We'll get back to Louise in another episode. Sorry. It's just that we were talking about Timothy in New Jersey. I think I got a little excited. Okay. Timothy. Tell us more about Russian hooligans. But before it was much worse. Just, just no, people, people. Do, do people die? Yeah. yeah. Before, yeah. Like, like before, they can take in knives and like everything. Right now, it's just, it's just hands. If you fall ground, they're not going to touch you anymore. Okay. And before it was crazy. That's crazy, yeah. It was that before scenario that was probably my worst nightmare when it came to hooligans. Walking somewhere after a game, making a wrong turn, and being met by a menacing group of guys who would immediately pick up on our lack of Russian language skills. All of a sudden, there's a knife in my stomach. And next thing I know, I'm waking up in a moldy, stark hospital room, wondering if, and maybe even hoping, I would just die. I had very low expectations for the Russian healthcare system, and it sounded like I wouldn't have wanted to prove myself right. Here's Boris again. What's the healthcare like in Russia? Uh, actually, we have uh, free healthcare. It's the all, uh, everything is paid by government, but okay. it's pretty shitty. Uh, I have to say. All of it. All of it is yeah. pretty shitty. The good news is that scenario never played out, at least for us. We actually did meet someone on our last night in St. Petersburg who wasn't so lucky. A Swedish fan who was piecing the puzzle of his previous night together as he explained a glaring wound on his forehead. So someone must have found me yeah. somewhere, you know, yeah. bleeding, you know, it's dying like this, and like he called an ambulance, and then he was all of a sudden in the hospital. If you want to hear the story of his late night experience in a Russian hospital, like Central Hospital, uh, oh, 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 I have the papers, I have the receipt. And a pretty entertaining anecdote of what it's like to cross the Russian border from Sweden on a sailboat. We accidentally crossed the border without noticing that it was a passport. Maybe it Head over to FiberMedia.com for a bit of a bonus episode. But back to these hooligans. In all likelihood, my worst case scenario of being mobbed by a huge group of young, violent Russian football fans was probably never going to happen. For a while now, especially leading up to the World Cup, Russian police have been working to clean up these scheduled fights from the streets, or at the very least, hide them from international scrutiny. If you want to learn more about that effort, there's a great ESPN expose we've shared on our website along with the episode. As you'll learn from that article, Russian hooligans aren't just rolling over. They're adapting and moving their fights to less frequently monitored areas, like the forests. And when they're found there, as you'd probably expect, they're putting up a fight. So the, this army class, the Spartak, was fighting okay. after a lot of police right. came to fight them. Uh, and they collaborate with the shower to start fighting the police. They keep everybody and after start fighting with each other again. <laughs> so they stop, they fought stop, the police, they, yeah, they, and then fought each other again. They're like, oh, we have a new competitor? Let's yeah. get rid of them. Yeah. So they're very organized. It's interesting the parallels between FIFA and Russian hooligans. They're both very well organized. They both have rumored ties to Vladimir Putin. And they both contributed to the single-story plot of Russian sports corruption that gave me pause leading up to our experience. And yet, they both failed to monopolize our attention during the tournament, or our experience overall. Rather, it was the football, the reason we were there in the first place, and the people we met along the way that we were able to focus on and enjoy. The more I look back on it, the whole experience feels like a lot of things in life. Sometimes there's tons of noise distracting you from the things you really want to focus on. Other times, when you are focused on something, it can feel like there's a limited amount of information on whatever it is you're curious about, and the limited perspectives begin to narrow that focus on a single aspect of that thing or place or group. But then, you get out there and experience it for yourself, and gain a new perspective on it, a counterspective. In our next episode, 
We continue to explore the counterspective Mike and I gained on Russia by recalling our experiences with those other elements of World Cups that we get excited about. For example, I don't know, those drinks. But more importantly, the drinks we had meeting great people. Very nice. Very nice. nice to meet you guys. Yeah. Yeah, nice to meet you. And maybe even a particular subset of people that Mike was especially looking forward to this time. I'm like fascinated by Scott's whole, like, I don't know what you say. It was just like Russian women love American men. Maybe. We'll see. <laughs>